if you can and you have those resources available to you, take the opportunity to pause and heal and decompress. You know, there was a lot of dreams that I had to grieve and let go of after getting divorced. And I wasn't ready to launch into something brand new immediately. Pausing, just letting it unfold, not making decisions out of fear. I mean, not that I wasn't afraid, but I was like, damn it, I'm not going to make this decision out of fear. Hi, and welcome to the Micro Empires Podcast, where we learn how to build small empires for wealth and security, because you don't have to be wealthy to build wealth. I'm Jennifer Grimson. I'm your host. Let's get started. Today, we're going to be talking to Allison Hoadley, and she is someone who I met through the Real Estate Investors Group here in Nashville. She's a woman who grew up in upstate Vermont, became a teenage mother, was a single mother for many, many years, had a total shift in the culture of money in her life once she went through a divorce, which is about the time that I met her. She's now building her micro empires, which include everything from using her self-directed IRA, which we'll talk about on another episode, to creating accountability groups to playing games to teach women about money and all aspects of money and also doing private money lending, which is what her specialty is right now for an organization here. She also does her own private money lending. So this interview was incredible. I've known Allison, like I said, for about three years, but I learned a lot from her today and I'm excited to share it with you. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great. So Allison Hoadley, who I met, uh, was it three years ago? Three and a half. Three and a half years ago. And We're, soon to be Bowen. Is it? You're changing your name. Okay. Well, my maiden name. Your, your original birth name. Mm-hmm. Good for you. That's a great name. Yeah. I love the name Bowen. That's nice. I also went back to my maiden name for the 20 years that I was single and now had a name change late in life. Who knew? That was crazy. <laughs> but I like to start, we're going to ultimately talk about private money lending, how you and I met through the organization that we met through what you're doing now. But I always like to start with kind of how you grew up, what the culture of money was that you were growing up in, and how that affected you, your work ethic and your feelings around money as a, as a kid growing up. Sure. I grew up in the Northeast in Vermont and the culture of money in my home was one, I would say we were middle class, lower, you know, mid, mid to lower middle class. My dad was a lifetimer at IBM. Mm -hmm. So while he and my mother were married, we lived very comfortably and they purchased a 180 acre farm. And so I grew up in the country with animals and, but you know, money really made a difference after my parents got divorced. When was that? How old were you? I was 14 mm-hmm. when they got divorced. And my father went on to continue to, you know, probably live at the same or better uh, standard of living, whereas my mother struggled to maintain the standard of living that, you know, we had had. And did you live with both of them? Did you go back and forth? No, it was at a time when t- I, typically I believe fathers weren't given the same kind of rights to their children. So I visited my dad and and I was an older teen. So I had activities that I was involved in. And one thing that did come out of that divorce, which totally changed my life is I went to live in Venezuela for a year. Oh, wow. That was my mom's solution to kind of protect me from some of the nastiness that you know, was starting to transpire. And that was amazing. So I went by myself down to live with a family that we were friends with. Wow. 11 months. I did my sophomore year in high school there. That's amazing. Yeah. So you, you know, predominantly grew up in a pretty stable financial household. Then they get a divorce, but you're living when you're in the States with your mom who is Mm -hmm. struggling. So how, like, how did that affect you? What was your, you know, your relationship with money, your feeling around money? I don't really recall having a relationship with money. I started working, you know, I got my first job when I was 16 when I could drive And that was more about my freedom, though, and my ability to spend my own money the way I wanted to. And I don't know. I think I grew up with a strong work ethic. Just I didn't even question it. Did you enjoy working? I did. Yeah, I did. I was a cashier at a grand union. I don't know that they still exist. At a grocery store? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. (laughs) I don't know if they still exist anymore. Yeah, I loved working. I really enjoy I've done just a variety of 
all different types of jobs before I actually, you know, came into a career. Yeah. And now I'm back to doing the jobs that kind of are exciting and fun and aren't a career. Yeah. And that's what I love about your story is it's unique in, I mean, everybody that I interview is unique, but uh, a lot of them are entrepreneurs who've started businesses and, and taken off or they're individuals who have ways to help people build a micro empire like we're going to talk about today very specifically. But in your case, you're in the process of building it. I'm excited to get there. We're, we're still in your childhood now. Okay. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think it's encouraging for people to hear. Like, number one, it's never too late. We all pick a number. Oh, I'm 30. I'm 35. I'm, the, you know, whatever. I wish I was 35, but I'm not. It's too late to do these things. It's not too late. No one thing has to generate millions of dollars. But it's not the same as saying, follow your dream, jump off the bridge, whatever. Because it's a very... I met you three years ago and you were at the beginning of going through a divorce. This isn't something that you've just been like, I'm just going to, you know, make macrame elephants and sell them on the side of the street. This was, uh, you know, I'm going to figure out and it's going to take some time. But I want to back up. So you're finishing out your teenage years Mm -hmm. and something happens. I graduate high school at 17. Did you graduate early? Mm-hmm. So well, did I. Uh, no, I so was just young. young. I was just young. Okay. So I started, you know, young and uh, they wanted to accelerate me in school, but my parents thankfully said no. But so I, you know, but anyways, and then I tried college for a semester and that didn't work well for me. And I got back home and ended up pregnant at 18. At 18. Yep. And what, what did you do? Where were you living? What did you do? Who did you go to? I lived in an efficiency that my mom had helped set me up in. After she knew she, you were pregnant? No, this okay. was before. And I remember I was working part-time at a bank. I had an evening job, which was wonderful for that stage of my life because I could sleep in late. I could go to work and then I could go out to the bars afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a perfect job. But the minute I found out I was pregnant, all of a sudden I had a whole new host of things that I needed to, I needed insurance. I needed to be able to pay for, you know, my care and I needed a stable job. I need a full time job. So the first thing I did was I looked for a job within the bank and didn't tell them I was pregnant and got a full time position so, on, in first shi- on first shift. And so I was already just like in the workforce. Yep. Just doing it. Did you finish school? Did you go end up finishing school? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. I finished school at 17 and this was... I mean college. Did oh, you end college. Up, not yeah. then. Okay. No, I eventually went to college because after... So I actually considered whether I should keep my child or whether I should relinquish it. And I ended up being a chicken and I couldn't imagine how I was going to live my life not knowing my child. So... Yeah. I uh, think I think that's a really important point. You know, my husband is adopted and many of us were have experienced unplanned pregnancies. My son mm-hmm. says to me, I was unwanted. And I'm like, unplanned. It's <laughs> different. <laughs> but the courage that it takes to choose to give your child up for adoption, if that's something that you have the balls to do. And I didn't. I didn't. I would not have had it either. I was too selfish, too self-absorbed, too stupid. I was a lot of things, at, you know, at, if I was at the age of 18. So you can't fault yourself for that. I think that's very normal. But when I look at these, like my husband's mother, biological mother, was a 16-year-old, you know, and um, his sister was also adopted. Same thing. So anyway, back to your point. So you just you keeping the baby. Yep. I keep the baby. And where were we going with that? Well, did you, you've got a full-time job. Did, did you marry no, father? No, 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 okay. no, no, no. So I, I wasn't going to compound this situation by marrying somebody that I didn't feel was, I mean, that wasn't where the relationship was headed. Um, but I remember what I was going to say. So becoming pregnant at a young age and being single was incredibly shameful for me and my father is a man of great pride and you know community minded and so I remember vowing to myself that I was not going to go on welfare because that to him would have been like the epitome of the worst is for his daughter to be on welfare or at least I thought so right and so you know I worked full-time attempted to single parent with very poor parenting skills and tried to go to college part-time Because I thought that was my ticket out, right? I thought, how am I going to support this child is I got to get a college degree. Pretty quickly found out that I couldn't do all three simultaneously because I sucked at one of them. Right. (laughs) So anyways, really, you know, I wasn't, couldn't ditch the kid. Right. That was non-negotiable. So the only two things were the college degree, which I really felt that was, again, how I was going to get out of poverty. And so I ditched the job Mm -hmm. and I made the choice 
thankfully, to go on welfare. Right. And that was huge, you know, after mm-hmm. having vowing to myself that I wouldn't do that. But it was so intentional. That's how I justified it to myself. I was like, right. I'm choosing to do this. I'm not doing it because I have to. I'm choosing to do it. It was a strategic decision. Mm-hmm. I went on welfare for the next four years. And I, in preparing for this podcast, I recalled that the I was in a special program at a small Catholic college in Vermont called Trinity College, and it was actually designed for single parents. Wow. So it was some groundbreaking stuff, and yeah. there was a volunteer component to it, so you actually had to give back to the community, and you were in school with other single parents, so they ha- they tried to create a community for us to support each other, and so it was great reflecting on that, because it's been a couple of years, so I'd forgotten about some of that. Right, right. <laughs> so I got my college degree. Mm-hmm. I was the first one in my family to do that. So that was... And you're single this whole time. Yep. So you yeah. don't... Well, I mean, had a boyfriend. I mm-hmm. had a serious boyfriend and was engaged at one point. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. He was a PhD student and that mm-hmm. was, you know, that really helped me because he was so much smarter than I was. And I just, I, if I think back at those things, you know, hanging out with people that are smarter than you is always a good idea. Exactly. So that's why you're here today. I didn't know. To hang out with me. <laughs> yeah, because you're smarter than no, me. No, because you're smarter than me. <laughs> no, you're smarter that's than me. That's how the, no, 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 you're smart. No. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, there's a couple things I want to touch on. And one of them is leading up to when you ultimately get married, I think for the first time, right? Okay. Cause that's, that's right. True. But with regard to the welfare statement, I think you know, I know there's a lot of shame in it. There was definitely a time in my life when I tried to go on welfare and I didn't qualify. And the only reason I didn't qualify was my car was worth too much. This was in California. So they were like, get rid of the car and you can have welfare. Well, I couldn't get rid of it. First of all, I was going through a divorce. It wasn't going to be a possibility. But that is what welfare is designed for. So that a single mother can take the time, get the education and earn more money. But statistically, and this drives me crazy, and I don't know all of my stats, but I certainly know it. The people who are 40% of the people who are on welfare are me and you. They're middle-aged white women. The rage over welfare, and welfare is uh, not a lot of fun. It's not, you know, it's not like you're rolling in the dough. And, or you get WIC, you know, the terrible food stamps, and they're only for crappy food. And that adds to the health problems and yada, yada, go on, go on and on and on. But when and if you need the help, if you can take it, you know, Anybody who takes that helping hand so that they can take a step up, that's what it's designed for. And it doesn't work otherwise, because if you choose to take it and you, your intention is to never do anything, it doesn't work. You end up in this terrible cycle. So I commend you for doing it. And I think you made the right choice and yeah. you made the right choice for your daughter. I did. I did. And you just reminded me. I mean, I wasn't just on welfare. I was on WIC. Mm-hmm. I was on food stamps. I had Medicaid mm-hmm. and I was a Section 8 recipient as well. Yep. Which is interesting as real estate investors now to look back on that. One thing I would say to women, if you're, you know, maybe considering accessing any of those resources, go get on the waiting list. But the Section 8, like the waiting list in, at that time was like two years. And I ran into this with my then daughter who, you know, grew up and ended up in some similar places you know, the two year waiting list can be daunting and you just never take action. And it's like, take action now because that two years, it goes by so fast. Right. I don't feel like it will, but so go take action now. Just, and even if your name comes up, you might not need it at that point. Right. Better to be that your name's on the list than be in a more desperate situation. Right. And take the, this is a theme we keep talking about, but take the avenues that are available to you, ask for help, whatever it is, whether it's your, your family members. I mean, there, there's a time when you ask for those things and you get them. And, you know, in my circumstance, my mother, well, I did when I lived in California, was going through my divorce. My gentleman who worked at the attorney's office who was representing me had filled out the form so that I could get the discounted rent. My mom paid that rent for a year. That's what had to happen. We had to have a place to live. I had to stay in California. I couldn't let go back home to where I was from. Mm. And this was the price that it was going to be. And she had the means to do it. Thank God. I don't know what I would have done otherwise because I had to work around a schedule so that I could keep the kids and blah, blah, blah. But so at what point do you get married for the first time? Like how old is your daughter? Where are you? She's 12. Okay. So I was a single mom for 12 years. And And what kind of work are you doing at that point? I graduated with a degree in business management and psychology. Mm -hmm. And so I married the two and my love is teaching and training. And 
I just went into human resources. It was kind of an easy, I wanted a training and development job, but there weren't many in Vermont. So an HR generalist is more common. So I worked for a couple of pharmaceutical comp or a pharmaceutical company in Vermont, which was phenomenal because you know, it was a big enough, it was an international company yeah. in this small Northern town in Vermont that I lived in and did that for about seven to 10 years. Mm -hmm. Eventually got out of HR because I got tired of implementing and supporting policy and procedure that I didn't have any part in creating and that I sometimes can be disagreed with. Yeah. So I actually left that, but stayed with the company, gave up my position. You know, I had a supervisory role, but there was so much pride in, in having like a title for yeah. me. And I chose to become a secretary mm -hmm. that had the same pay, but it was the kind of work that was more fulfilling. Right. And they did that until I got pregnant after many, many years of trying for my second child, 19 years later. So you marry when she's 12 and then you're married seven years before you get pregnant yeah, about, for the second time. So I think about, five, about five years so it took us. She's yeah. 19. She's 18, 19. Yes. And uh, she's pregnant. And for she's her. pregnant. Oh my gosh. I just did that math in my head just now. <laughs> so you are pregnant with your second child at the age of 30 something. Yeah. I was in my late thirties. And so you, I, there was a ticking clock, right? Like my last two pregnancies were high risk. Oh my goodness. I think it was 38 and 39 were my last two pregnancies. And your daughter was pregnant at the exact same time. Yeah. So she's 18, 18, 19. Mm -hmm. Did she come to you and tell you? Did she? What, she didn't. She, she hit didn't, it. She hit it. Wow. When did you find out? I actually, I'm trying to remember in that pregnancy, every pregnancy, she's had, she has three children. I have three mm -hmm. grandchildren and every pregnancy was a little different. And that one, I'm having a hard time remembering. Yeah. I think because of the joy that I was experiencing about expecting my second child, it helped kind of diminish some of that. I will tell you a funny story about one of the pregnancies. It might have been her second because mm -hmm. I'd had both of my children because soon after we couldn't get pregnant for five years. And then 18 months later, we had our third child. Wow. <laughs> I'm nursing thinking, I don't have to worry about birth control. You're a new mother and a grandmother at the exact same time. Exactly. Mm. Yes. yes. So, Knock it all off. Yeah. Pull the bandaid off. Yeah. All before 40, which I was, <laughs> I was grateful. Right. So we're, we're driving home from Massachusetts because I, I stayed home with my children. So I left full-time work. I had worked so hard to get a full-time job. I had worked so hard for my salary to get to $50,000. That was like my dream. Like I just want to make $50,000, which in Vermont at that time for a single woman was, you know, right. really good wage and a good living. And I got in there and then I decided to put it all aside because I wanted to raise my kids. You know, I hadn't had that time with my first child. She was in daycare from the time she was six weeks old. Yep. And I didn't want to miss a moment with you know, these other two children. So we're driving back from Massachusetts and I got a call from my oldest and she told me she was pregnant. I totally got lost. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I mean, my kids love to tell this story because I was like, I had to stop and kind of figure out where I was because it's right. it so through me. But yeah. Yeah. So you marry, mm -hmm. decide to be a stay at home mom mm -hmm. and you are in that position for how long? 30, 13 years. 13 years. And yeah. so so we talked about the culture of money as a kid. Then you're raising your kid. Your culture of money is I got to make it, got to provide. You had goals set in mind. You mm -hmm. had a, a career that you were following in a path. What happens in those 12 years? And what is your your family then, your culture of money? Is it, you know, and I do you control it? Does he control it? Is it scarcity? Is there fear? Actually, so our culture of money was informed a lot by a new influence in my life, which is my religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. So I had a conversion in my life before getting married and my culture. Um, and part of that religious belief was about your role or money specifically or just women? No, it was more about just my relationship with God, but it so created this unrealistic framework that I tried to live out of. I wanted to be this amazing mother the, you know, this was my second chance to do something that I hadn't done well before I wanted to love my husband. I wanted to be a godly woman. I mean, these are all things that I truly wanted with like every part of my being. And I just never was able to attain that. And I always thought, oh, God is going to do this in me, you know, and, and, you know, he's going to make this, this great work of me. And I used to have visions of my ex-husband and I being on a stage telling our story about how hard it was in the beginning and how God had done this great work in our lives. And, Sometimes I think maybe we'll still tell that story even though we're divorced because, you know, great things right. can still happen even though we're not married anymore. But 
So I lived kind of this fantasy, but I was home full time and he was actually working from home eventually. So we spent a lot of time together in the home, but I had a lot of control over our finances. We had one income. Mm -hmm. He was doing great. While I was working full time, he had actually gone to college and he had gotten this amazing opportunity in Vermont. And so it put him on a trajectory which, you know, now he's a high income earner here in Tennessee for a healthcare company. Right. So, you know, that that's what you all both strategic. work for. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. It wasn't about me and my career or him and his career. It was about us, what we were doing as a team. Right. Unfortunately, what happened was when you get kicked off the team. Right. <laughs> you get voted off the island. Yes, you get voted Your off the words. island. I yeah. love that. When you get voted off the island, if you haven't been strategic about what that looks like, if it ever happens, and you're kind of starting from ground zero where I was right in 2016. Right. And I, I say this all the time. I'm going to say it again at the uh, risk of my popularity rating going down. You never know who you marry until you divorce them. And that works in all ways. Being a someone who was single for 20 years when I was dating, certainly part of my dating requirement is how does that person treat their ex-spouse? You can also find out that someone is really just a good and fair person. That may not be the case but truly when it comes down to that. So with you, you say you had control over a lot of the control over the money. You may not have been earning the money, but strategically you're building this empire together, your own little micro empire within your marriage. So when you head into divorce, how does that change? And what were the realizations for you as it pertained to money? Cause that's about the time I met you three years in, you're just heading into that divorce. Right. Well, divorce just brings out the worst Mm -hmm. in all of us. And so areas where we had been really amazing at sharing and I started to get controlled by a lot of fear, financial fear of being broke. Yep. And so that was kind of ugly for a little while. I think what was interesting when I met you was you were going through a divorce. And even though when you moved into that marriage, you had had this corporate job. Mm -hmm. So that's the most logical step. You're leaving the marriage. You're going to move into a corporate job, but you didn't. Mm -mm. You chose, and maybe you knew, and maybe you had this strategy all worked out, but I met you as a person who was like, I'm not really sure what my next step is going to be, but I know I want to map out a path Mm -hmm. that's going to be very unique. Don't know what that's going to be yet. And we met at a real estate investors group and you were just there. It's the same reason I went there too. I was like, well, if I want to learn this language, I better go out and into the city and try to speak the language with all the people who speak it. So I just started going to the, to the meetings and absorbing and you were doing the same, but I, I had a corporate job at the time. And I remember thinking, well, she's going to have to get a job. I mean, she's, she's just going to have to get a corporate job. And I was just shocked at the fact that you, you weren't doing that. So you made this decision. So tell me about why and what you did and the steps you did to start to build these micro empires that you have many of now. Yeah. yeah. So the key point was my kids. Not only had my ex-husband's income just risen to this phenomenal level for our family when we were married, he had also reached a level of freedom, mm-hmm. even in his corporate job. He was working from home. He could alter meetings. He could leave early. He could he had lots of vacation benefits. So I knew... Having worked in HR, having worked in the corporate world, starting over, vacation benefits, flexibility, income, all of that, I was going to be married to this full-time job. And I had teenagers, and I don't know, those of you who may have small children, you think they require a lot of time when they're little? Well, you wait until they're teenagers because... Really parenting a teenager is waiting for a moment when they'll actually respond to you. (laughs) So you have to make sure you get the most airtime with them. And, you know, we had a lot of healing to do after our family imploded. I call it, you know, our divorce is like a family implosion. So I I wasn't willing to give that up. So I learned how to live meagerly. Mm -hmm. I I set myself up financially so I knew I could make ends meet. Then I went after this real estate investing thing. And yeah. I had read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, actually when I was married. It sat on my nightstand, I think for five years. My aunt had given it to me and wow. said, hey, you might want to read this book. And I eventually read that book and it is what started the domino effect in my head around my relationship with money, my relationship with work. Mm-hmm. And I think that's more important than anything because, well, first of all, if you're interested at all in real estate, 
um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is I, the Bible, I would say, to get started, to get started where you need to, like, if you don't even speak a word of real estate, read it. It's tiny. It's, you can read it in a couple of days at the most. And um, I keep a copy. I hand them out. It's definitely good. But it is also the money lessons. It's about the attitude, et cetera. And money can only buy you two things. It gives you options and it gives you time. And that's it. It doesn't buy you anything else. There's no happiness. There's no love. There's no peace with your children or your family or anything. But if you're, if my car breaks down and I need 400 bucks, if I have money, I have the options to fix the car, buy a new car, get a ride, do whatever. And it buys me time, meaning how I spend my time, what I do with my time, et cetera. If my car breaks down and I have no money, I may not be able to go to work, which exacerbates the problem or fix the car or do any of those things. So I don't need to remind myself of that, but I I find it funny when people haven't really thought about what money does, and that's really what it does. But those two things are like the most important things in my. I want time, Mm -hmm. and I want options, right? Always. Yep. So you joined the real estate group, and when I met you, I would never have guessed that your marriage had been to someone who that you had built this empire with your ex husband, because you were living very meagerly. You were uh, living in a little apartment. In fact, you got some furniture from me. Yes, that's um, you right. inherited some some much loved furniture from me, which is good because that that couch that couch has seen seen a lot of good I still things. Have it. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Listen, uh, that's that's amazing. I love those stories. But you were a very different person than you are today, and we can joke about it now. But when I met when I first met Allison, I tell her now it was her Holly Hobby phase. Mm-hmm. Um, you had the little prairie dress i mean i don't really know that you had a prairie dress but to me i was like what on earth is like that was what i was covered in is that kind of persona yeah you had the long hair and Mm -hmm. the and it was just uh you know i probably looked like fonzie compared to you you know i just felt like i was like i was so drawn to you cigarette smoking you know whatever there weren't a lot of women in the group at the time right right but pretty quickly you were there to learn and absorb and you did you dove in i saw you following people i was doing some of the same things but we didn't overlap Mm-mm. like i said there weren't a lot of women and then it feels like one day you walk in the hair is cut off she's got the new outfit she's wearing the makeup yeah she apparently you know you know stopped by and had like a whole makeover and so what was happening internally and externally during that that time because you're scared what you're telling me is you're scared financially at least enough to go, I'm going to live really lean till I know what's coming. So one of the things that I did is I paid a guru. Ooh. So if you're in real estate investing, you'll hear the stories of you receive this mailer that says, come to our workshop. We'll give away free iPads. We'll teach you how to flip houses. And I was an HGV, HGTV watcher. So right. I had loved trading spaces and all those rehab shows. So I went to the lunch didn't win the free iPad. But who was it? I'm wondering if you want to tell me. It wasn't anybody that, that we know. I don't remember who anybody they, you trust. I don't remember who they used to draw me in. But <laughs> then I paid for the weekend thing. And then I paid for the upgrade to include going to Vegas, boots on the ground workshop here in Nashville. So I spent a good uh, chunk of money, a lot of money on an education, on an education. Then I end up that's when you saw me. You saw me coming into the real estate investing world because I was like, I spent all this money, so I darn well was going to do something with it. So you did all that before you came to our investing Mm group? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, and I didn't talk about it because it's kind of a little bit of, you know, you don't want to tell many people in the investment rooms that 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 you'd already done that. I do now. Now I don't care. But when I was early on and I didn't want people to think poorly of me. But, you know, I think that's important, though, because there's a couple of things. Number one, if you're going to learn a new language, a new environment, like podcasting, the first thing I did was to join a podcaster group. The second thing I did was to pay mm-hmm. to go to the largest podcast convention because I had no idea. I was the only, per- I swear, I was the only person there who had no idea what was going on. <laughs> couldn't plug a mic in. Couldn't figure it out. Still can't. Don't really care to really understand that you just stuff. just get other people who know how to do that, That's right? That's right. <laughs> But, you know, did I spend more money than I needed to? Probably. Did I spend money in all the right places? No, but I had to learn. And so it's the cost of the education. So whether or not that those initial expenses paid off, it probably taught you some things of what not to do. Oh, it fueled my fire because I was not going to have spent that money and not do something with it because it was about pride for me. It was about I am not going to be one of those people that, you know, dumped all this money into this and then never did anything with it. So I darn sure was going to go after it. 
And then I found the Real Estate Investors of Nashville. Mm -hmm. That's really where I began to shine. And you know our good friend, Philip Reichwalder, who... I used to go to his meetings faithfully twice a month, deals, deals, deals. And, and that was, I sometimes would get up and make myself look good just to get to that meeting. And that was, that was sometimes the thing I woke up for, for a little while in my life. And I made friends like you there. Mm -hmm. I just found my people. Yeah. Um, I think that, and that's really important too. These, these are just all so important. Number one, when you're in a difficult situation, find something that will get you off, up off the couch. mm -hmm. I was the same. At the time I had been going, I think I'd been going a little bit longer than you, but I hadn't, I had only just discovered the meeting and Philip is a unique guy. I've interviewed him before. I'll interview him again, but he's a unique guy in as much as his story is he had a Toyota ish, as he likes to say, and he was renting a room for like 300 bucks when he started doing real estate investing. But he started this group before he had, he didn't own anything. He didn't buy anything. He didn't own anything, but he did it to immerse himself And he called it the corniest, cheesiest thing, deals, deals, deals. And he'd come out with his slick pack ponytail. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, who is this guy? But it was infectious. Mm -hmm. And we would cram 60 people in that room. We all were drinking the Kool-Aid. The Philip Kool-Aid. The Philip Kool-Aid. And I haven't been back since Philip doesn't lead it anymore. And it's maybe just as amazing. But I'm kind of like, it's not Philip. (laughs) But I think all of those things are important. Get yourself up off the couch. Find a tribe, Mm -hmm. find the people who match your energy. And if you are surrounded by people who are like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm going to do next. Or my poor me and I'm getting a divorce. I'm the only person, I invented divorce. I'm the first one in the world. And that's how you're going to feel as opposed to, yeah, you know, we meet people all the time who are like, yeah, I lost $800,000 in that house. And you know what? I picked myself up and I kept going. Pull up my bootstraps and yeah, I kept going and kept going. And and that was a place for me to kind of explore. And that the networking group didn't exist to create that for me. We used to introduce ourselves at Deals, Deals, Deals. I'm not sure if they still do that, but I remember like some weeks I'd introduce myself in different ways. Like, yeah. I'm like who am I this week? Trying like, it on. I, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of, I was in a state of becoming mm-hmm. and I just embraced it. And then I went after leveraging. I had lots of time. Yep. You know, I had created a life that I had lots of time. So I pursued three people that I had identified in the networking organization that I might want to work with and ended up Philip and I picked each other and I worked for him for two and a half years. That was amazing. Just negotiating with him, pursuing him and saying, I have value that I can bring to you. I didn't necessarily know all of what my value, I just knew there was something that I could bring to his world that could help. And so we discovered that together and then even negotiating like the amount of hours that I was going to work and my pay and then, you know, working together for two and a half years, it had fluxes. So there were times when his business needed more hours. So could I work more? And it was this amazing process of becoming someone who can negotiate and who could ask. So one of the one of the books that you I mean, you have had an impact on my life. I could talk about you a lot in this. Oh, good. Let's do that. That sounds amazing. (laughs) Sounds fascinating. (laughs) But that's a book you introduced me to. And I went and read Women Don't Women Don't Ask. Women Don't, Women Don't Ask. And it's phenomenal, the research that, yeah. that exists. And depressing the, as hell. Yeah. The, the, the financial impact of not asking a mm-hmm. simple question. When we talked to Sherry Deutschman the other day, she talked about how she hired two people at the same time. She made yes. them the exact same offer. She offered the woman 45000 She offered the man 45000 The woman took it without argument. Yeah. The man negotiated more. Then he came back and negotiated pay raises probably two or three times. And so a few years later, she's sitting in the office with that same woman and the guy walks by and Sherry says, he makes a lot more money than you. It just tells her because you never asked. Mm -hmm. You never asked. Whose fault is that? And I mean, that's as a business owner, if you aren't going to ask me for more money, I'm not just here to be like, oh, you did so good. Let me give you a raise. (laughs) I mean, that's that's your job. Yes. Or to prove to me or to work it out. Yep. So you don't have to name them, but who are the other two people that you chose to follow and why? Or what what did they look like, I guess? Were they men? Were they women? Was there a reason there was Philip? Okay. All men. So when I went to the Guru Conference, it was starkingly apparent that there were so few women in this field. Right. And that became crazy. Really, that was where my passion was born to really encourage women to understand money more and get involved in investing. You know, that was just a, like, oh, I want to change this. I want to be part of changing this. And so I came back home. There was three men that I identified. 
and they were all very charismatic. Mm-hmm. Eventually, at that point in their investing careers, they were all involved in a lot of deals and all seemed very trustworthy and just above board. You know, my gut, I chose the right one. Yeah. I chose the right one. One of them's fallen off the rails. Yeah. And another one I don't think has fallen off the rails, but I don't see them anymore. And, and you know, actually that person and I met and it just, it wasn't the right fit anyway. Right. So, you know, regardless of kind of where that person's real estate investing career went, it wasn't where I was supposed to be because I'm in touch with Philip. Philip and I still are friends. He texted me just the right. other day, a funny little, you know, incident happened. And I mean, we're in each other's world. I mean, when he brought me on, one of the things that he said to me was, don't get too comfortable here because I'm not letting you stay. You're going to do this eventually. I mean, he believed in me. I think that was... Right. You know, that was one of the things as a woman, I was, I'm much older than he is, you know, so it was like he was my little brother. Right. (laughs) But he was helping to pull me up out of this dark place. But it was his belief in my ability. We both had agreed. I'm not, I'm only here for a time. I'm only here for a season, but eventually you're going to go on to do your own thing, Allison. And he just would speak that into my life. And I hadn't had many people in my life speaking that kind of stuff. So it was so powerful. And I mean, that was just who he was. He wasn't doing it just for Allison. Right. He's also one of my favorite people, also someone who put me in the car and we drove around neighborhoods and knocked on doors and asked people to buy their houses, stuff that I'd never considered before, taught me from the bottom up, you know, drove outside as as one of the houses was there was an eviction going on and just craziness. And and I thought, I can do this, you know, step by step, I can do this. Very generous person Mm -hmm. and just a dear friend. And you can't always know this, right? But also a very honest person. But if someone's going to lie to you, you aren't stupid for believing them. They're a liar, right? Mm -hmm. But he is an honest person. So just that's where if you're walking into something you don't know, you do have to kind of do some due diligence, get in front of them. I can think of somebody individually who I trusted very much and thought was very trustworthy, who was not. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank God I didn't personally invest with that person. But I didn't have any signs because he was just lying. So, you know, what are you going to do? Yep. You know, you just got to you just got to roll with the punches with that. Do the best that you can with the information you have. So you volunteered. Mm -hmm. You worked. You volunteered inside of Wren Mm -hmm. with Wren Real Estate Investors of Nashville. And then you you now have built your micro empires and you have several of them. Somebody taught me that multiple streams of income is a really good idea. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Always have at least three streams of income. So you did that. Had you, have you seriously though, was that wasn't, I wasn't the first person I was. I think you were really, you were. Yeah. So before that, you just thought sort of one thing. I wasn't sure what I thought at that point, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I had loved staying home and raising my kids. I had never planned on returning to work full time. Right. So it was, it was never in the cards. My ex-husband and I talked about starting a business together. So I thought I would eventually do that. I never thought about doing one thing full time. You know, I've had such fun jobs when I was raising my kids and, you know, back to the money mindset. I studied Dave Ramsey's approach for a while. And, you know, Mm -hmm. one of his suggestions is go get another job. And right. So I was. In forty, in my forties, I became a lifeguard, so I could leverage getting free lessons, free rentals, and free ski tickets for my kids because we lived in the Northeast. Our, my whole family of four, so, yeah, you know, I was homeschooling. This it was gym. It was twenty minutes from our house, so you know, I was having fun doing jobs. So I never saw myself going back and doing one particular thing. But the multiple streams of income, I think, came from you. Okay, I have well, to give good. you credit for that. All right. yeah. I take my ten percent commission on all those. That's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Well, I've always been a treasure hunter. So yeah. one of my hobbies is selling on eBay. I've been selling and buying on eBay f- for probably 15, 20 years. I've bought wow. cars on eBay. I've bought gold on eBay. Now, see, I'm going to need to, I, I need to explore that more. I knew that about you, but I didn't know to what level. I'm barely making it. I just liquidated three houses and I am had to sell the furniture and I'm barely getting through Marketplace on yeah. Facebook. Marketplace so. is rough. Oof. Yes. It's a lot. Yes. It's a lot I of work. I prefer eBay. Okay. Right? But Marketplace is in t- touch intensive. You have to like yeah. be in relationship with and, your and buyers we, and sellers. And we already know that I don't actually like people. So there's <laughs> there's that <laughs> issue. So I know you have a rental in mm-hmm. Chattanooga because I've sat inside of it and yes. recorded a podcast yes. as well as sitting on the floor. So that was a purchase and a rehab. You did mm-hmm. several things there. I'm going to run through some of the things that I know that you have and you tell me what you want to focus on. But you started accountability groups. Mm-hmm. Private money lending, which mm-hmm. we're going to talk about in a little detail. 
and then you you do the cash flow game uh, yes. with women specifically, yes. and then this other, I think, the real estate chicks, which is where you're still investing if you're still doing that. But just tell me about your what you're working on, what generates money, what maybe doesn't, but what your plan is, mm-hmm. if there's mm-hmm. a plan. So the cash flow game is just a passion. Mm-hmm. It's like find something you enjoy to do, you enjoy doing and invite people to do it with you and amazing things can happen. So the two groups of people that I feel passionate about talk about mindset and entrepreneurship. You really have to have a passion that keeps you going. Mm-hmm. Cause one of the things you give up when you leave W2 work is an office to go to and a boss that makes sure you're there. Yep. So it's easy to not get off the couch or get out of bed. Yep. So there has to be a strong and compelling reason to be doing what you do. So women and youth and youth, like teens and young adults, are the the groups that I feel passionate about serving. And I just I love to play cash flow. It's a fun game. I love playing games. I'm very competitive. And um, so and the cash flow game it was developed by Rod, Robert Kiyosaki, who is the writer of Rich Dad, Poor Dad and a million other books. And it literally is about cash flow, which is a game that we should all be playing from the age of 10, 5, 6, whatever. But you specifically focus it on women. Yes. Well, or I no? just, yeah, I just, I mean, there's nothing about the game that I focus around women. Uh, you're right. Robert Kiyosaki created the game. He actually created the game before he wrote the book oh. because he believes like I do that we learn best by playing. Mm-hmm. So the book is great, but to actually put the concepts into practice, what he, you know, teaches in the book, the game helps you do. And I just, Love creating a space for women to come and explore their own ideas about money, their own ideas about investing to kind of stretch their knowledge and awareness of mutual funds, of stocks, of how to make decisions. I mean, it is so cool to sit with women who are playing this for the first time because the first time you play it, it's actually a little rough. It's it's super slow because you're having to, you know, understand a lot of stuff. But they're like, I don't even know how to make this decision. What should I do? Right. And I'm scared to play this game now. This really scares me. No, it does. <laughs> no, I think I'm like, oh, I'd be good at that. And then I'm listening going, shit, what if I sucked? It's okay. It's oh, a game. Okay. All right. It's a game. It's a game. Yeah. But and you're the competitive one. You're like, it's okay if you lose. It's fine. <laughs> but I never win. I'm never I'm... competitive. I'm not that competitive, <laughs> yeah, right. actually. Oh, not. No, no, no okay. I'm not. So, well, the, the way you win in this game is you get out of the rat race. So yeah. you're not competing against each other. You can actually do you're deals together. To you're just trying to get out of the rat race. Yeah. And the rat race is trading your time for money. Right. Do you, do you know what that's called? Like trading my time for money is having a job just oh, yeah. over broke, right? Yeah. Yep. So just over broke. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very Amway. I remember getting a pitch from Amway and someone telling you, to "Oh no. <laughs> no, no, no." Um, but the concept is true, and I agree. I think um, I want to do more about that with this podcast, where it creates environments, and I and I, you and I have talked about this. Obviously, we talk a lot because we're friends. Creating an environment because women are very specific. Women specifically, they don't ask, right? Mm-hmm. But and not that they don't ask because we ask now. But I ask for everything. I ask for I ask for things that I as I'm asking, I'm going. This is I can't believe this is coming out of my mouth, but I'm going to say it anyway. I just negotiated a discount on a birthday gift for my son the other day. Right on, <laughs> right on. I mean, that's why. Why not? Because they have the right to say no. I said that to Mignon when she was here, too. I said, you know, I ask questions and my face is like this. You can't see it on the phone, but I'm I'm cringing as I'm going. I can't believe I just said that. But they have the right to say no. Mm -hmm. But in games and environments for women specifically to do things like negotiate hard for your salary, negotiate for your time off. That Mm -hmm. is one of the things that had you and I, I coach people on this, but I'm always like, Whatever you think is the most they can pay you, ask for 20000 more. Ask for three more weeks in vacation because here's the math and it's not that hard. And, you know, be the big swinging dick. Walk in and you know everything and you do everything. And unless you hear that over and over and over again, you really can't believe it. Mm-hmm. And there's always going to be people that are going to be offended. Like, I can't believe you asked for that. How did that hurt your soul that mm-hmm. I asked you for something? Right. So I love that you're doing that. I love the games and the accountability groups. How did that happen and what did that come from and where is it leading? That came out of a need in my own life for accountability Mm -hmm. and my boyfriend's life. So my boyfriend is a CPA and, you know, he and I are both investors and we just have 
big dreams and big goals. And we found that like many people, our goals would kind of get put to the side as the adventures of life just kind of distracted us from them. And we didn't like that. Like we, we really like our dreams and our goals. And so we wanted to stay focused on them. And so we said, well, let's start an accountability group. Like if you need something, go, go create it. Right. So we did that last year and it was it was phenomenal. I mm-hmm. mean, I am I am a uh, relationship person. Like I function like in these kinds of communicating and group settings. I just kind of come alive a little bit. So it's really my thing. And I was like, okay, I'm going to quadruple this in 2020. And, you know, Philip taught me that life is an experiment and to just go out there and try new things. And right. if you're not a little bit embarrassed the first time you do it, then you didn't stretch yourself enough. Right. Every time we try something for the first time, when we look back on it, we should go, ooh, you know, like that probably wasn't my best work. But it's just the beginning. And so I decided, well, I'm going to just, I'm going to try it. And yeah. so I did some marketing. I put in some new systems. It was so amazing because it helped me to grow in ways that are helping me in my lending as well. And I've got three groups that launched and the year's not over and I still have plans for it. I started charging last year. I didn't charge this year. I started charging. Yep. That was a huge step for me. Mm-hmm. It was not easy, mm-hmm. um, but the right step. I, yeah, exactly. The right step. Mignon was talking about paying one of the people who worked for her and she couldn't pay her enough. Mm-hmm. And she knew that she wasn't paying her. And she said, I want to honor your value or something. I'm going to forget the thing, but I just thought it was an amazing way of saying, and we all know this, if, if people aren't willing to pay for something, then that's the value they're going to put on it. So you may have to fire a lot of people. That cost will go up and up and up because most people, an accountability group is something that most people, I I always say um, I love a deadline and I'm also like a well-trained dog. Like if you tell me the four (laughs) things I have to accomplish by tomorrow, they will be accomplished by tomorrow because I'll be upset if I didn't deliver them. And it's amazing. I mean, it's still alive in my life. Even though I lead these groups, I still participate in one of the groups as my accountability group. So it is such a powerful concept and I don't know where it's going. I just signed up for a business vision workshop in St. Louis in March. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited to go there and explore this. And, you know, this has been for me expanding into what is my value as a person. Right. And I think that's where the money piece was hard for me. It was just being able to be comfortable with having value, speaking about my value and then asking that others you know, recognize that value or say, no, I don't want it, you know? Right. So that's been an amazing business for me to kind of embark on. And it's a joy to run the meetings. I'm not sure where it's going to go. That's good. Uh, Yeah. And tell me about, well, you also have a rental, but maybe we should, uh, if you want to talk about the rental or if you want to dump into the private money. I've owned three houses in my life to date. Mm. One I lived in for 16 years in Vermont. The second one was my rental in Chattanooga that you recorded your podcast in and I bought that in my self-directed IRA. So one of the things that I learned about when I came to real estate investing is I had this chunk chunk of capital that used to be tied to my employer when I was working and that was my 401k plan. I was able to convert that into an IRA and move it into what's called a self-directed IRA, which I didn't even know those things existed when I was employed. (laughs) I'm doing an episode on them. So no, me neither. And I I guarantee 99% of the people listening to this don't know that they exist or that you can buy real estate at them. I know. So, Mm -hmm. you know, when you're employed, you can invest in mutual funds and stocks sometimes, but and you can borrow it to go and sometimes buy real estate. You can take loans out from your 401k, but they don't typically allow you to purchase property in your 401k. But once you move it out of the organization and you be- gain control over it through a custodian that allows you, to, they, you can buy precious metals, you can, yep. um, buy, you can property, buy stock in a, in buy a stock. company. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can buy businesses. Mm-hmm. So I had done that because that was my in. Like I was so hungry to take action and get involved in real estate investing, especially after I worked for Philip for, you know, a couple of years. So I had this capital. He actually found the deal for me. I bought mm-hmm. this rental. He re- he started a construction company down in Chattanooga. He rehabbed it for me. And and yeah. it's all being paid through your self-directed IRA. All through my self-directed IRA. Which was an old 401k yeah. that was sitting there for 150 years that you never touched and never thought about and didn't know that you could use that money. I mean, I doesn't actually, it make you angry? <laughs> it, no, it just, no, no, no. I mean, it's just that it took it took me so long to learn these things. Yeah. But then, you know, I meet most people and they think every time I mention it to somebody who doesn't take the time to really look at it, 
they think that I'm talking about cashing out or that I don't know what I, and I'm like, okay, all right, I just, you know, I, I those are the only two options that we have though, right. That we're taught that we're taught. So exactly we're, right. we're, you know, we're taught to buy a house and a mortgage. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that's the best way to buy a property, even a mm-hmm. personal home. We're taught to get a job, to go to college, right. you know, all of these things that, you know, you and I are a little bit weird. Yeah. Because we don't, we don't move in those That's not this podcast. It's a different <laughs> show altogether. But. <laughs> so so I, in the third property that I now own in my self-directed IRA, I actually got in a foreclosure. So And you just did this. I just did yeah, this. I have, I, that my jealousy radar went up the other oh. day when you told me. So what? tell me the story and I'll try to keep my envy down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's just, it's all an adventure. And I lent money to a person I didn't. So my first hard money loan that I did with my self-directed IRA, because you can also lend money, mm-hmm. was to my dear Philip. Yes. My trusted, you know, mentor. So no, no challenge around trust there. Well, I found an opportunity to lend to this young man in Chattanooga who was buying a property in Paducah, Kentucky. And it was a real challenge. But yeah. the amount of money that I was lending was so small that I was like, I can do this. Like, I can experiment with this. Like, I go back to this experiment all the time that Philip taught me about. And so I lent him this money. Can you, let's tell me the dollar amount. $12,000. $12,000. Okay. So you're, and I, I think this is important because when people talk about this, I think it's important to invest in ways or take chances with a dollar amount that will not put you out of business. So $12,000, you don't want to lose that. No. Nope. You want it. I'm going to make money. But it's not going to put you out on the street. Exactly. It's not $200,000. So you did $12,000 to this Paducah, Kentucky property. And then what happened? Well, I learned so much. The whole process of going through that, especially with someone you don't know, Mm -hmm. it's a whole nother level of lending. And I think you made two payments the whole time. But you know what I learned? I was like, I sucked at communicating with him. Like yep. I should have been on him the first payment he missed and been like, you know. So there was just so much I learned through that process. And eventually I was like, enough is enough. You know, this loan is secured with property. I think it's time I take it back. And thankfully, didn't have to go through the foreclosure process. So you I called was, the note. You said, I'm, I secured it mm-hmm. and I'm taking the property. Exactly. And the property is valued at? I don't know. Yeah. Yet I actually have to have a breaker's broker's price opinion done on it because I'm trying to calculate what to do with it now that I own it. But it's more than twelve thousand. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that's the idea. And that's well, that's a nice segue because we'll get right into mm-hmm. what it is you're talking about. So now you work for an organization, and what you do is private money lending, which mm-hmm. I've practiced because we call, we called them hard money loans, and apparently that's sort of the filthy. The filthy term. Um, and I've done I've done private money lending, learned it also through Philip. Actually, I think he might have been the only person that I've done it with. Haven't done large amounts, did small amounts. Mm-hmm. But the reason I like this is it, it is a stream of income. So if you're somebody who only has like an old $40,000 or $12,000 401k and you're like, well, how can I make money with that other than maybe moving it around in the stock that you invest in, which is certainly an option. You can do something like a private money loan. So can you walk us through, first of all, how you got into this, the organization that you do, what your job is there, and then step by step what someone will do and how it works. Okay. So there's two separate issues. I don't want to get them confused. So doing a hard money loan out of my self-directed IRA is different than what I do now with property recycling. Okay. So I can give friend rates. I can, you know, all, with all the money that I lend directly, that's my own money, but that's where I got my start. I mm-hmm. learned it from uh, another dear friend of ours, Claire taught yes. me how to be a hard money lender or private money lender. I just made the mistake I know. myself. <laughs> Sometimes you so slip bad. back into old habits. So I quickly ran out of my own capital. Right. It all got tied up very quickly. I bought a rental. I lent out that small $12,000 loan. And then I was an angel investor in another deal that That's you right. even considered That's before right. me. That store. Starting up a natural food market in Nolensville, mm-hmm. Tennessee. So done. My money's all deployed. Right. It happens very quickly. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what am I going to do next? And I was boating with our friend, Mike Grady, this past summer. And I said, you know, I'm so good at networking. I've got to find a way to make money doing something I'm good at. Like, isn't that what we all dream about doing is, you know, love what you do and do what you love. Mm -hmm. 
he was like, well, why don't you come work for me and, you know, market my private equity money? So that's what I do now. And so this is an organization that has a bunch of funds, mm-hmm. private um, equity funds that Mike Brady, he's created it out. Yep. And he's lending it out mm-hmm. and it could be for various things and he makes money on it. Mm-hmm. So walk us through why someone would choose to do a private money loan instead of go to a bank. Oh, goodness. Mm -hmm. So some people just plain out don't like banks in our world. I'm one of those people. I don't like banks. Yeah. You know, they don't like that banks, you know, are making money on our money. They, they, they like to keep it within the family kind Mm -hmm. of thing. But some people are entrepreneurs, so they don't have a W-2 income or they're business owners. And when you're a business owner, a lot of times what you are trying to do is pay the least amount of taxes. So you will write off a lot of expenses. So what does that do to your income? It kind of lowers your income. Right. So when you go to the bank, the bank says, well, you don't make enough money to. Right. So, you know, there's this delicate balance there. So we exist for, for those people. We also exist for the people who don't have a strong enough credit score to go to the bank. And the reason that doesn't matter to you is because every loan will be secured by something. Yep. Piece of property, something. Yeah, pretty much it's all property. We only lend to businesses or entities. Okay. So when you're borrowing from us for some kind of real estate project, either fixing and flipping, multifamily, we can do bridge loans to stabilize a multifamily situation. We do have loans to cover new construction, and we also have cash out refi loans for your buy and holds. So we have a wide range of products that can you know help real estate investors. Our money's a little more expensive, but because your debt to income ratio really doesn't matter and your credit doesn't have to be super strong, you do have to have at least a 620 credit mm-hmm. score. Our rates are a little bit higher and our terms tend to be shorter yeah. than what a bank's going to give you. So you just rattled off buy and hold, debt Sorry. to income, all these words, all these terms that a lot of people won't know. So we won't go into all of those because if anybody's interested in the end, we're going to tell them exactly where to reach you yes. and and how they can do that. And two things, and I want to make this clear, is that you do private money lending for an organization, for businesses, but you also have been a private money lender with your own funds, which are now taken up. Yes. However, uh, you and I both know people who still do this. Mm-hmm. So this is a world that I didn't know existed. Mm-hmm. Had I known it existed, I would have used my money in this way before I did my self-directed IRA, bought land, I, what have I done? Hard money loan, land, and uh, stock. I bought stock in a company, but certainly intend to be even more aggressive when I sell one of those assets. So we'll, we'll give the resources of how to reach you um, in the end. But I did want to just kind of walk through, is there anything that I haven't covered? Because then we're going to go into the questions that I usually ask people. And I've lost the plan. I'm just following. There's no real plan. I know. So I don't know if there's something we haven't covered. Well, I appreciate you being so transparent, especially about the personal side of your life, because I think that it is the thing that is most intimidating. You know, people, I kept my story a secret forever. I was so ashamed of it. But also, especially in the corporate world, I was just telling Mignon, I never lied about my age, but it was very hard to know like exactly how old I was because the ball was always moving. And now I just tell people how old I am because I don't care. Right. But in the corporate world, it was important because there's a lot of ageism. And it just was good business for me to not for you not to really know how old I was. It's also, you know, you didn't want to admit that, that um, for me anyway, that I'd made these horrible financial mistakes and that they'd buried me more than once. And that at some points in my life was going to a food bank or I couldn't get a credit card for years and uh, was living, you know, penny to penny. So I appreciate you being transparent about that. Oh, well, about thank your you. Life. This is, I'm experimenting with telling my story. Today. I think you should tell it. You'll well, find this is, this is my chance. You're you giving go. me the platform to like, I'll get to go home and listen to myself someday maybe and go, Ooh, yeah, I need to tweak that a little bit. Might be a little embarrassed about how I told it this first yeah. time, but well, and you know, the th- what I've found is since I've started sharing the story is there hasn't been a person that I haven't spoken with that hasn't said either me too, that happened to me too, mm-hmm. or, you know, they're bl- just blown away by all of it, or they know somebody, you know, Hey, my mom, her, you know, I talk about this a lot again, A lot of women, unfortunately, their retirement strategy is maybe I'll meet somebody. You know, they're 55 and they're like, maybe I'll find someone and we'll get married and Mm -hmm. then I won't have to worry about retirement. That is a terrible strategy. 
Um, statistically, not likely, especially if you're not going to join a dating app, which most <laughs> middle-aged women are like, I couldn't possibly do that. And I'm like, really? Because it's kind of a numbers game. But anywho, <laughs> uh, but you go on ahead with yourself. So question number one that I have is what do you consider to be your biggest financial mistake? Having abdicated my financial independence to my concept of marriage and my idea of what I was supposed to do as a good wife. And I just didn't take care of myself during that time. And it wasn't because my ex-husband in any way that was it's not to reflect on him negatively at all, but I just didn't own that I might have a need to have a financial future of, of my own separate from him. Right. So you just let it, you just were a good soldier. Yep. Basically. Yeah. yeah. And I invested everything into our financial future, Mm -hmm. our money, my contribution to our family was my time and energy and care. And, you know, I can tell you at this point, my teenagers are like, you know, dad just took care of you. And I'm like, yeah, that's not really how that's not what happened. But, you know, they're teenagers. So but that was that was my value that I gave. And I wish that I had been smarter. But that's probably the biggest mistake that I made because, you know, after the big D then I was like, oh, Back yeah. to square one. Yeah. <laughs> Figuring it all out for yeah. the first time. What was the one thing that had the largest impact on either has or you think will on your achievement of financial independence? You're in the middle of it now. You're building these empires. What do you think has been the one thing that's had the biggest impact? Pausing. Mm. So, you know, you yourself said she's going to have to go get a corporate job and you weren't the only person. You didn't share that with me, but there were right. people in my life going, aren't you afraid? Don't you think you should go do this? And so pausing had a huge impact just letting it unfold not making decisions out of fear and desperation I mean not that I wasn't afraid but I was like damn it I'm not gonna I can't make this decision out of fear it has to really unfold and and I had the opportunity I'm so fortunate not every woman is in the position that I'm in so I I you know, for the listeners out there, I just want to acknowledge that. But I know a woman who's in my world and she lives with her parents and yep. she has a couple of children that are teenagers so that she's not a young person, you know. Right. So if you can and you have those resources available to you, take the opportunity to pause and heal and decompress. You know, there was a lot of dreams that I had to grieve and let go of after getting divorced. And I wasn't ready to launch into something brand new immediately. Right. So I took the time, I paused, and then I let things kind of unfold and I gave myself some opportunity to explore and experiment. Yeah. So. yeah. I think that's really smart. That's basically mindset. What's your favorite financial independence resource, book, blog? And you can't say Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I know. I have to pick one. The Secret of the Millionaire Mind. Oh, okay. I don't have that one. Yeah. Yeah, that was the first mindset book that I read around money, Mm -hmm. um, other than Rich Dad, after Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it was recommended by Philip. Okay. So that, I would say that one. Gonna write that down. Mm -hmm. And the best piece of advice you've gotten, I think you mentioned it, but you can. Well, I think go find somebody who's doing something amazing in your world and just say, how did you do that? Yep. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Just start looking around you and. Be patient with yourself. Don't give up. Mm -hmm. Surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. I know you only asked one piece of advice, but I got lots. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm the same way. Constantly be around people that are smarter than you. And it's, it's scary. You know, you got to ask people to spend time with you that you might get rejection. Yep. You know, they might want to say, I don't have time for you. That's right. Or I don't know all the other answers, but I keep asking. I keep asking. See, I mean, that's right. I'm telling you, you have had a huge impact on my life. Thank you. (laughs) I'm glad. I'm so glad. No, I agree. I'm not afraid to ask for anything anymore. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, rejection, I rejection. I wrote this actually to, um, uh, podcast movement rejected me to be a speaker and I, they sent me a form letter rejecting my proposition. And I wrote back to their form letter going, I eat rejection for breakfast. And they called me that afternoon and said, we want you to write an article for our newsletter, which goes to more people than come to the pot, to the, to the oh my thing. Gosh. So yay me. Yeah. I was like, that's right. I eat rejection for breakfast. So what do you think are the most common myths that women specifically have that limit their success? You didn't give me this question in advance. <laughs> common myths. You know, there's, there's a lot of common myths about powerful women. Mm-hmm. and how they're viewed negatively 
and I've had to the word witch that rhymes with witch that starts with a B, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. which is so bullshit because yeah. you know that's just confidence in a man. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. I see Andrew smiling in the background. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I have this one friend, and uh, I won't name any names, but I said to him, you know, if, if I if I behave like you did, I would be called that that yep. word, which that you know rhymes with which but and we laugh about it now because he's just confident and I was like oh dang I so wish I could move in that and in 2019 that's what I decided to do I kind of just didn't give a anymore and I said I'm just I'm never going to be small again that's right to make other people feel comfortable that's right I'm all done apologizing exactly I'm all done trying to apologize to make you more comfortable listen I'm five foot eleven I've had to like slouched my entire life to make other people comfortable and i finally married someone who's six six so thank god but um you know it's a small thing but it's a big thing where i've just decided like i just i can't slouch anymore i'm not Mm -hmm. gonna i'm not gonna fold myself up to fit in your package you know so get over it i'm large and i'm here so get used to it (laughs) large and in charge what are you i'm gonna ask this question what are you not good at you're good at a lot of things and why is it important so to know messy. what you're not good at? You're messy. So messy. Yes. I didn't see that coming. Yes. Because I hired you at one point to organize my life. But I can do that for other people. <laughs> but my, I've, it's so hard to do it for myself. I'm terrible about invoicing. Mm-hmm. So that's like every person that I've worked for. It's like, come on, Allison, are you going to invoice us so we can pay you? Um, it's when you go to Upwork. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Cause you gotta, that's a, that's something that you can let someone else do for you. Right. Content writing. I'm yeah. kind of I'm stretching myself now to to write more, but that's not an area that I'm comfortable in. You only need one. You only need one. I think you're great at amazing and oh. at most things. <laughs> but I like to know, like when people, you know, when I'm interviewing people and they're just they're amazing at everything, and kind of it helps to go, what do you suck at? Because like parenting, yeah. <laughs> But guess what? You're all done. Well, you're not all done. You still Almost. have kids. That's right. You still have kids that are underage. All right. Tell us how people can find you and get the money from you. Get yes. the, uh, tell yes. us tell us where you want us to find for all of the things you're working on. Okay. So for cash flow, I created a Facebook group. So at this point, you're going to have to friend me, Allison Hoadley. I'm not sure how to make it more specific than that. Allison Hoadley. And then it's there's a cash flow game. And there's the, do you call it the cash flow chicks or what is it it's, called? It's actually, it's a group, but I haven't made it public yet. Okay. So I can't really just friend me and I'll put you in it. But like, I wanted to give the group the announcement that I was making it public before yeah. I did it. Okay. So I was giving it a couple of days, but people will be able to come and request to join pretty soon. But it's only for ladies. Sorry, guys. You'll have right. to start your own group. Yep. I'll get over it. Yeah. If you're interested in accountability, mm-hmm. you can text the word, two words smushed into one word, get focused. Ooh, that's two. all caps or doesn't no, matter. Doesn't, just doesn't text. Matter. Just a word. All, no spaces. Get focused. No emojis. Nothing. <laughs> uh, to three one nine nine six. Three one nine nine six. Get focused. Get focused. And then they get in the accountability. Group. They'll be kind of like in my system. And right now, I don't have any new accountability groups, but mm-hmm. I'll be sending periodic content out just to kind of encourage people, give some tips and tricks around accountability, goal writing, and then when the new next groups you know, I can roll them out. They'll know about that first. Good. And then if you're interested in private money to invest in real estate, you're ready to do some deals, some fix and flips. You can email me at Allison at property com. Perfect. That's Allison at property com, And that's it. Or you can go to www.propertyrecycle.com. But, yeah, but they really want to go directly to you. That's true. That's the, I that's mean, true. Mike's okay, but. Well, Mike's going to send them to me anyway. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> I'm right. I'm the front gal now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And remember, I said this to you before, and you're doing it. You're doing a great job of it, but you are the brand. No matter who you work for, you're the brand. So they're going to come and they're going to do work with Allison, who's representing this company, but it's because they have the relationship with you and they trust you. So just always keep that at the forefront of your mind, especially as you're building your new brand. So yes, thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you would subscribe and review this podcast, it would mean the world to me. It truly is the only way for me to know how I'm doing and what you hear and what you'd like to see in the future. 
If you want to reach me, you can at a lot of places. My website is www.micro-empires.com. You can email me at jennifer at micro-empires.com. You can call or text 213-973-7206. And of course, you can reach me on social media, on Facebook under my name, or Micro Empires. I have a page in a community. You can find me at Twitter and Instagram under my name and of course on LinkedIn. Thanks again, everybody. See you next time.